Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great love for us. Jesus, we thank you that you gave everything for us. As we've just remembered your body that was pierced for us, nailed to a cross for the blood that uh, spilled onto the ground and that covers us from all of our sin. Thank you, Lord. We pray that, Lord, you will lead us through this time, Lord, as we look at your word. We know that it will not come back empty because that's what your word says, and you're always true to your word. So, Lord, lead us. May your Holy Spirit just rule and reign now, uh, pointing us to you, uh, to the way, the truth, and the life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, there we go. Welcome. If you're new, we are so glad that you came to join us this morning. You're, you're very, very welcome. Uh, I'm Paul. I'm the lead pastor here. And uh, uh, just grateful that you chose to join us today. If you are uh, familiar here um, and been coming for a while, we are, st- we are glad that you're still with us. <laughs> and we haven't scared you off or anything yet. So uh, thankful. Uh, last couple of weeks you've had as part of the teaching team. Of course, Jacob uh, shared a word a couple of weeks ago with us and did a super job. Chris, their friend from uh, Chicago, and or well, now Dallas, Texas area, he shared with us he will never be asked back again because he wore a suit. So I'm just going to say that right now. Um, he, uh, yeah, I don't need help in making me look bad, okay? No, I'm just kidding. He did a super job and he will definitely be, uh, he is very welcome to come back here and share with us again. Loved hearing it. Um, we have been blessed, blessed, blessed as a congregation, so thank you to you guys for that. Um, well, we're in week number seven of our study of the book of Acts. Uh, we're talking about these 28 chapters that literally changed the world. And I'm not sure exactly what all you're learning, but hopefully we're all learning as we study this book more and more that because of Jesus' words, teaching, life, his death, burial, and certainly his resurrection, we are seeing the way these early followers lived and thought is much more radical than perhaps we've we've understood it to be much more radical than many of us are comfortable with uh, myself included in that and as we compare our lives today based on the words of jesus with the life of these followers based on the words of jesus i wonder i'll speak for me i wonder if i've lost something or if i've avoided something or am simply too selfish or too self-centered to take seriously the life that Jesus calls me to. I wonder if maybe I've avoided asking the right questions. Uh, Brian McLaren writes in his book, The Secret Message of Jesus, he says, he gives us some questions to consider. What if Jesus of Nazareth was right, more right in, and right in different ways than we have ever realized? What if we have developed a faith system that makes reverent and honoring statements about Jesus but doesn't teach what Jesus taught in the manner he taught it? And what if his message had practical implications for such issues as how you live your daily life, how you earn and spend money, how you treat people of other races and religions, and how the nations are to get along? I mean, do we really want to know and understand this message? And I'm asking myself this, and how it changed these early followers. Think about the disciples, pre-resurrection to the disciples post-resurrection. Massive change, right? Massive change there. And if we do want to know and understand this message, how much do we really want to know and understand it? Enough to look hard and think deeply and search long in order to find it. We said that this book of Acts is about a movement. And we started off with that crazy video that we saw this guy (laughs) dancing at the Sasquatch, Sasquatch Festival crazy dance and then others started just joining him in that you can look that up on youtube just just look at crazy man dancing at sasquatch festival it's great we said though this book is about a movement and perhaps we should find ourselves asking how much do we long to be a part of this movement i need to ask myself that how much do i really long to be a part of this movement do i really long for the movement that's about the restoration of all people and things do i long for justice and mercy or would rather sit on the sidelines and sing about it or complain about it do i long for the end of moral decline and long for a holiness movement without moving closer to the lord and to those who really need to see what real holiness looks like through my life and through yours 
through Christ working in me? Do I long for a church that's packed out but fail to recognize the part of the go that I'm supposed to play a part of that Jesus commanded? And do I want to extend my circles to include those who are different than myself in order for Christ to use me and extend his love for them? <coughs> do I really want that? And do you really want that? One man uh, remarked, um, he was telling a friend of mine about this. He's involved in a prison ministry called Kairos. Anybody ever heard of Kairos ministry? It's a prison ministry. It's a great, great ministry. Uh, they go into correctional facilities on the weekends and just extend this, uh, this message of Jesus, the hope of the world, to those inmates. And this, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this man was sharing with this friend of mine about that weekend and one of the men and one of the men's responses to that. But the men are asked to focus on three questions. And here's the three questions. What spiritual condition did you arrive at for Kairos? What did you find here? And what do you plan to do about it? One inmate answered those three questions this way. He says, I, I knew almost nothing about Christianity when I arrived. I had no spiritual condition. I did not grow up in the church, nevertheless even really been to church. In fact, my view on church was not real positive. And in answering the second question of what did you find here, he says, well, like these other guys have said, I found love and I found family. And to the third question of what do you plan to do about it? <laughs> I love his response. He says, I want to be a part of this movement. He caught straight away. It is absolutely a movement. It's a movement of God's plan to restore this broken world. And I have to ask the question, do, do I have that same passion? Do you have that same passion and desire? Well, let's dive into chapter 5. This is going to lead us into this chapter today, uh, starting in verse 12. Last week, of course, Chris talked to us about Ananias and Sapphira. Of course, that's a real church building um, passage right there, isn't it? I mean, scare the life out of you, literally. So... Um, so this morning, we're coming in just after that, starting in verse 12. Now, many signs and wonders were done among the people through the, the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. That's a very fancy word for porch, all right? Solomon's portico is one of the great porches of the temple there in Jerusalem. And here's the image I get with this. Now, sorry, it's just my brain the way it works, so... I apologize for that. But this is the scene that I get from this. Y'all know who buskers are. Like buskers, like street musicians out there. Y'all seen those? I like can go down Nashville. Sometimes they'll be out there, um, around there. In Ireland, we had some great ones on Grafton Street, Pedestrianized Street there. These guys would draw huge crowds. You had to have your A game to play out there. They'd draw massive crowds where you couldn't even walk through the street. It was amazing. That's, that's what I'm kind of getting the idea of here. Imagine now if we all owned, and it would take all of us and then some to own the Ryman Auditorium downtown, right? It's going to be a little pricey. But imagine we were blessed and we all, we all pulled our funds together and we got to own the Ryman Auditorium or the Ascent Amphitheater downtown. And imagine some buskers come and they start playing outside on the street corner of our fine Ryman Auditorium. And imagine that right there in the middle of our busiest concert season, these buskers begin to draw great crowds, huge crowds. I mean, they're just a small, informal, motley collection of musicians, probably look a bit like Cooper and his friends, some, not that you're motley, but just, you know, musicians, <laughs> maybe motley, I don't know. Anyways, but that, that they're, just this, they're just this collection of musicians, and they're playing this strange mixture of, like, ancient classical music and these strange new unheard of songs, probably much like yourselves, Right. Um, but you think, oh, well, that's not bad. That's okay. It's not bad. They're just there until people start paying more attention to them than to who we have in to share their music. They start gathering around to hear their music more than they're coming to pay uh, money to come in and see our shows. This band of buskers begins to become well-known, Cooper and the Boys, right? And and, and people start talking about them, and they start writing articles about them and reviews about them, and Rolling Stones just, just loving on them, something fierce. Maybe it's time that we got to call the police, get these buskers out of here. Maybe we got to get them to enforce some long-forgotten law just to get them gone. 
This is the image that I get here of what's going on here at the temple, out on the porch, if you will, at the temple. I mean, it'd be one thing if these crazy followers of Jesus were meeting and drawing crowds in Galilee, you know, some dumpy place far away from here. But the audacity, they are doing this at the temple in Jerusalem. Can you imagine what these religious leaders are thinking about this time? This temple area was not just one building. It was more like it's a massive area covering acres. My guess is that it just wasn't even Solomon's portico where this little band was playing. It's safe to say that the song they were singing was the same thing that Peter sang, or spoke, rather, in chapter 2. It was all about Jesus. So it makes sense why this was an issue. Look at verse 13. None of the rest, that is the crowd, dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. Now, why did no one dare to join them? Probably afraid they're going to get rested. Maybe they just heard about Ananias and Sapphira and going, I don't know about this movement. I don't know. Verse 14, yet more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, great numbers of both men and women. Now, this is a big deal. For the first time, women were mentioned when mentioning numbers. Before, when they counted, always just be the men. But now, post-resurrection, people are getting restored, men and women. It's beautiful. So Luke wants you to know that straight away. Women were a part of this story. Verse 15, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats in order that Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he came by. Now, there was a superstition at the time being touched by a man's shadow resulted in contact with his soul and influence. So if Peter has the Holy Spirit living in him, he's got the power of God living in him. And it wasn't Peter's shadow. It was their faith in Jesus. That's what made them whole. Verse 16, a great number of people would also gather from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all cured. On these healings, N.T. Wright says this, he says, the fact that so many people coming to Jerusalem and being cured was not simply a matter of a sudden burst of healing energy. It was about, and everyone knew there knew what it was about, the establishment of a new reality in a dangerous place. The power of the living God becoming concrete, definite, undeniable, not simply a matter of a few people telling a very strange story and behaving from time to time as if they were drunk. Well, the religious leaders, they'd had enough. They're done with these buskers, out with them. Verse 17, then the high priest took action. He and all who were with them, that is the sect of the Sadducees, were being filled with jealousy and arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. Now, that phrase, filled with jealousy, is translated zeal for purity of religion there. They were resenting the teaching of the resurrection. These religious leaders couldn't allow this to continue. God's honor, they thought, would be compromised. Israel would be led astray. And they, more more than anything, they were going to lose control. It's a response based on theology uh, and political power just like what we saw with Peter and John back in chapter 4. So now the guys are thrown in prison. Verse 19, But during the night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and tell the people the whole message about this life. So this angel gets them out of, breaks them out of of jail and says, Here's what I want you to do. Go stand in the most public place and talk about this life. Now, one of the fascinating things that, that, about Acts is that nobody knew what to call this new movement. They didn't know. Uh, I mean, it's not until chapter 11 that we hear the term Christianity or Christians. Later on, we'll see it called the way. Here, for the only time, it's referred to as this life. I love that. I think it's very cool. I think that's a, we should change our name to this life Christian church. It's actually so... It was a strange way to put it, but you can see what's meant. I mean, these followers weren't quite simply living in a whole new... They were living in a whole new way. Nobody had ever lived like this before. They'd ever tried to live this way, my guess. Nobody had ever even imagined living this way before. Well, to verse 21. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and went on with their teaching. Those buskers are back. They're back. They're making that noise again about Jesus. They're teaching about Jesus. 
And they're starting to get the crowds again. Well, that morning, the high priest called together the council and the whole body of elders and said, hey, bring the prisoners to us, not knowing that they'd been broken out. The temple police went to the prison, obviously couldn't find them there, and they came back and reported. Verse 23, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. The guards, it's like they didn't even pay attention. They didn't even know what happened. Verse 24, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were perplexed about them, wondering what might be going on. Then someone arrived and announced, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the temple police and brought them, but without violence, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they, found, they had them stand before the council. And the high priest questioned him, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood upon us. They refused to say the name of Jesus. Verse 29, But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. He's trying to say here, this story is connected to the story of Israel. He's the God of our ancestors. This isn't some new God. This is the same God. This is the completion of that story they started back with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses. This is the same thing, guys. Come on, get on board. Let's go. Verse 31, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior so that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Now, he's basically saying forgiveness and salvation, it's not found in the temple. Peter tells these leaders here, it's like another presentation of their Christology connected to the story of God. Verse 32, and we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So we're just telling the story here of what God's done, is what he's saying, and is doing. And he says, we must obey God rather than human authority. And with this, I believe Peter and the followers are assuming the roles of outlaws. Did you ever think about that? They quickly became outlaws. Not criminals, outlaws. There's a difference here. A criminal, by definition, is a perverse rebel who acts out against the law, usually with any social and sociopathic violence. An outlaw moves outside and beyond law, usually in the form of civil disobedience. They have passion for justice, dignity, and freedom. We always cheer for the outlaws, don't we? Robin Hood, right? Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Gandhi, these folks were outlaws but they're fighting for justice, dignity, and freedom. The response of the religious leaders is about what you'd expect. <laughs> and when they heard this, they were enraged, and they wanted to kill them. Probably had enough there to justify their deaths, actually. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, if you got your Bible there, circle that name, underline it or something, or remember it. A teacher of the law, respected by all people, stood up and ordered the men to be put outside for a short time. Now, Gamaliel, this is a major name drop here, okay? Huge, huge influence. Well known from the Jewish sources from that period and later. Mentioned throughout the ancient literature. He's remembered as one of the greatest rabbis of all time. He was an expert in the law and taught it to all who would sit at his feet, including Saul of Tarsus. <coughs> Excuse me. Saul of Tarsus, who would later become Paul the Apostle. He was considered the greatest teacher of the day. In the Mishnah, it says, when Gamaliel died, the glory of the Torah ended. That's some massive words to be spoken about somebody right there. A man of great influence in this religious setting. Here's what he gets up and says. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then he said to them, Fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, uh, about 400, joined him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished, 
and all who followed him were scattered. In other words, hey, look, people have been here and done this before. They've tried this. They've tried to claim they were somebody. And after we killed them, well, nothing happened. Verse 38, so in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. Because if this plan or this understanding is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be, you may even be found fighting against God. See, God's already released them from prison, and nobody can explain it. Like, hey, how did these guys get from here to out here? What happened there? There's something going on. And he's saying, just, just wait and see. Later, we'll see his student Saul, of course, reject that approach. He gets very proactive the other way. He's like, we're going to nip this in the bud right now. And he says, it really matters who somebody comes from. And it says, they were convinced by him, and when they had called in the apostles, they had them flogged. Now, that's a very customary punishment. It's used as a warning to not to continue in an offense. And it consisted of 39 lashes with a bared chest in a kneeling position. One was beaten with a triple strap of uh, calf hide across both chest and back. Two on the back for each stripe on the front. Not fun. Not fun. In fact, many were known to have died from this punishment. It was quite severe. They were beaten to produce shame because this is a massive here shame, honor oriented society. To be dishonored like this would be considered just shameful. Their hopes were that the shame would deter them, but it didn't. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And as they left the council, they rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. So as they're walking away, I wonder if it came to their minds. They're, they're like recalling the words of Jesus. Wait a minute. Hey, didn't Jesus say this would happen to us? Like, didn't he tell us this was going to happen? Maybe, maybe that's where their joy came from. Like, oh my goodness, we actually lived up to what Jesus said was going to happen. Like, we, we did this. It, it kind of brings to mind that scene from Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, the last one, the, the last movie there. You know, after it's all finished, and yet you still have 45 minutes left of the movie. Uh, Frodo, they, he and Sam have dispensed of the ring. It's done, and he wakes up there in Rivendell, you know, home of the elves. And, and then everyone starts coming into the room, and they start jumping to bed, and they're just so filled with joy. It's like, because joy of being on a mission despite the suffering. And those, those little guys, they suffered, I'm telling you. Well, there's a word for that. And we've talked about it before. It's called communitas. Communitas. And it's about being in community on mission. To verse 42. And every day in the temple, at home, they did not cease to teach and proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. Now, these followers of Jesus represent this emerging group that's actually being forced out by Judaism. So, and so it's developing its own identity. But I want you to remember this. They never sought separation from Judaism. They never sought separation. This was not their idea. This was supposed to be the completion, the fulfillment. It's the leaders who were saying, no, you can't be a part of us. I think that, that the, this might be the heart of this passage is you just can't help, though, but talk about the thing you love. You can't help but share your passion. That's what these disciples did. They could not help but talk about Jesus. Do you know any people like that? They just can't out help but talk about their passion, whatever that is, like Andy's frozen custard. I mean, it's just insane. It's so I can preach all day on that, but you know people like this, don't you? There's an Old Testament passage I think of when I think of a passion like this. It's found in the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 20, verse 9. It says, his word is in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. And if you don't get fired up reading that passage or hearing that passage, you ain't alive. His word is in my heart like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones. That's what these disciples felt like. This fire was in them. They had to get it out. They had to share about this, this meaningful life, this life because of Jesus and who he is. They could not help it. 
Do you have a passion about Jesus like that? Does, does yours reflect that? I'll be honest, mine does not all the time. And I'm, I'm ashamed to say it, but it's not. And I want it to be. I want it to be. Today, we see a world full of all kinds of passions, don't we? Just script through social media. You'll see tons of passions. Like you see people uh, so passionate about the environment that they'll block traffic protesting the use of oil. That we see people passionate about veganism. Nothing against vegans, but some of them get so, they're so convinced that's the only way to live that they're passionately protesting outside of restaurants that don't comply with that kind of ideology. We see people passionate about their political parties and ideologies, and they can't begin to, begin to comprehend anybody else being just like them in their party. Uh, but here's the thing. Misplaced passion is one of the most disheartening things you could ever see. It's like, really? We're going to get that fired up about that? Seriously. The point is, how does this passion change your life? I mean, what's the result of having this passion? How does it affect those around you? A friend of mine wrote a skit several, several years ago about three different people. And there, there are three different monologues, and two of them are conspiracy theorists, and one is a follower of Jesus. He, he did this after he visited Dallas and got to see, went through the whole JFK thing and, and all of that tour. And each of these figures here went through the facts and details about their passion for these things. Now, the point of the sketch was not to compare the facts, but to compare the passions, how only one passion changes your life. And the sketch ended with all three characters saying these few lines. They said this, things, these things I have shared with you so passionately are all true. They really happened, and I can prove it. I know them to be the truth deep within my heart. And then the two conspiracy theorists stopped and ended there. The other character, the one who spoke of Jesus, continued. It says, and it has given meaning and purpose and hope to my otherwise meaningless and hopeless life. This truth has changed me forever. And again, the point is to compare the passions and how in one in particular can change your life. It's like a fire, a fire shut up in our bones. Someone once said that their idea of what we call evangelism is, evangelism is when you love something so much, you can't help but talk about it. Well, Michael Frost, the man who wrote our, our book that we're looking at in our journey groups, and that you all are welcome to. I've got copies out there. If you can't be a part of a journey group, please get a book. Take it. You will love it. It's going to be really challenging. It's going to be great. You'll love it. Anyways, he talks about how he was speaking at a conference of Christian surfers in Australia, which he's, he's Australian as well. Um, they were specializing there in surfing in Australia um, and, and talking to a group called Christian Surfers. Now, they're also international, but he was talking to those there. And they go around, and they basically set up uh, clinics, surfing clinics, tournaments on beaches all around the island. And they also talk about Jesus with those surfers. And Michael says they're a, a fantastic organization. Well, he's speaking at this conference to these Christian surfer uh, leaders. And he said to them, Let's have a little exercise. Tell me, who's your favorite surfer? So he says, now you can only imagine in a room full of 100 surfers or so, it's pandemonium. The moment he says, who's your favorite surfer? They start throwing out names left, right, and center. It's like chaos. And finally, he says, one name seems to rise to the top, a guy named Kelly Slater. Anybody here ever heard of Kelly Slater? There you go, a few, few folks. There we go. Um, he's now retired, and he's an American surfer. He won like 10 world championships. He was just an amazing, amazing surfer. Michael said, okay, okay, let's talk about Kelly Slater. Let's use him as an example. What do you know about Kelly Slater? And again, with a room full of surfers, they start shouting out facts and figures and everything. It was just chaos. Like they were bursting out of their skin. They couldn't be the, wait to be the first one to share this information. Like they talked about where he grew up, how many brothers and sisters he had, where he lives now, what famous uh, girls he had dated, and all the things he had won, 10 world championships. One guy, though, yells out the wrong information, so all of them start shouting him down and go, no, no, you're wrong, and they start correcting him. He starts throwing things at him. Um, 
They're telling stories about how he won his eighth title and how it was just neck and neck and how it all played out. Every tiny detail, yelling out all this information at the same time. And then finally Michael says, okay, that's enough. Calm down, calm down. We're done for that for now. A little later in the day, he comes back and Frost says, he's talking to them about Jesus being their reference point. He says, like, I want you to be like Jesus with these people you encounter on the beaches. So tell me, what do you know about Jesus? And stone silence. Could have heard a pen drop. Silence. And he goes, no, come on, come on, let me have it. Tell me, tell me everything you know. Tell me your favorite stuff about Jesus. Finally, somebody says, he died for our sins. Another one says, uh, he's the son of God. And another one says, he's my Lord and Savior. Frost said, okay, why can't you talk to me about Jesus the way you can talk to me about Kelly Slater? I mean, is that it? Is that what we've got, he said? Just a few stale phrases that we've been saying for centuries? During a time when people are asking the Jesus question more than ever before, he says, it's time we learn to talk about Jesus differently. He says, I'm not saying that the Christian surfers group was that they don't love God. They do, and they do amazing stuff with the kids that they teach surfing and teach about Jesus. They lead kids through a systematic presentation of the gospel. But he says, I don't want you to make Jesus simply a point in your presentation. Frost said, I want you to know as much about Jesus as an obsessed surfer would know about Kelly Slater. I want to be able to walk into a room, he says, and ask the question, hey, what's your favorite thing about Jesus? And just get overwhelmed with everybody just saying everything. Oh, man, he's my hero. Man, he's savior of all. Man, he's king of kings. And just going on and on and how from him comes a world of justice and peace, mercy and joy. And when people were with him, they felt like they were in the presence of everything the world should be like. I want them to say the same about you, he says. He says, I want them to say, oh, man, those followers of Jesus, man, they laugh louder than anybody else I know. Those followers of Jesus, they they love more than anyone else. Those followers of Jesus, they serve more than anyone else I know. Those followers of Jesus, they give more than anyone else. We want them to say, I'll have what they're having. I want to do what they're doing. I, I, we ought to hold the best parties in town, he says. We, we ought to give away more money than anyone else in town. We ought to work harder for justice than anyone in town. So I feel like this idea of when you love something so much, you just can't help but talk about it. Well, that's one of our main, main points for today. And the second is this. That's back to Gamaliel and his words. In describing this thing being established by these followers of the resurrected Jesus, he said, if it's of God, you will not be able to stop it. So when you add these two ideas together, you can't help but talk about what you love. And if it's of God, you'll not be able to stop it. You know what that equaled back then in the book of Acts? 30 years that changed the world. And we are living proof of that, right? Or you can say it this way, passion plus mission equals movement. Or even another way is a question. If your passion had a mission, what would be the result? If your passion had a mission, what would be the result? So back to our first questions about that. Do we really believe this message? Do we really long to be a part of this movement? May any and everyone see in our community here the story of Jesus happening in a living people, you and me, a people fully convinced of its reality. And may it be like a fire shut up in our bones that we cannot help but to express. We cannot help but to live out. We cannot help to share with those around May it be like a fire shut up in our bones. This message of Jesus, the King of kings, the one who came to death and said, you're out of here. Drop kicked it to hell where it belongs, along with our sin and our brokenness. 
can't help but talk about something that good, about how he took my life and he rescued me and he redeemed me and he made me his own and he presents me perfect in front of him because of his blood. How he's taken your life and he has made you whole and complete because of his sacrifice, his death and resurrection. That should be like a fire, fire shut up in your bones that you have to share. You have to live this out, this good news. This world needs good news. Are you aware of that? It's pretty desperate right now. Let the fire out. Let the fire out. Matt, let the fire out this week. Todd, let the fire out this week. Dave, let the fire out this week. Avery, let the fire out this week. Olinda, let the fire out this week. Let the fire out this week. It's not about blowing them away with all the facts and figures that you know about Jesus. It's about loving them like nobody else has ever loved them before because Jesus loves you and is flowing through you into their lives. That's the fire. It's about speaking truth in love. That's the fire going out. Are you going to let it out this week? Maybe some of y'all need to get into the movement. Maybe you need to come and let Jesus come and take and make set up residence here in your heart. If so, this is a great opportunity to do that this morning and just go, I'm, I want me in. I want in. Let me in. I, I worked hard on this baptistry this week, so much so I got happy with the chlorine. Um, and it's ready to go. It's heated up. It's ready to go. We got some clothes in the bathroom there. We got towels. We are ready to go. This could be your morning. Say, I want to be a part of this movement. I want to, I want to put to death the old self. I want to be identified with Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. And I'm going to let the fire out. Maybe that's what you need to do this morning. If so, and this is great. We'd love to do this. I'll I, got, I brought my swim trunks and t-shirt. I'm ready to go, man. We can do this. This is a moment for you to join the movement. Not just join a movement. Join into relationship with the creator of it. The king of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of the universe wants to have a relationship with you. This is your moment. To, to accept that. We're going to sing. We're going to let the Holy Spirit do what He does. And I'll be down here in case you want to talk about this or you want to go ahead and give your life to Him. Or you want to be a part of this movement here in this fellowship. And if so, now's a good time to say, hey, I want to be a part of this family and I want you to be a part of mine and we're going to do this journey together. So come on up. Let's do this. Let's do this. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Because Jesus, you've done everything 